Um, my name is Mark Baggett, and I am here to give you a presentation in all lowercase, getting the, getting the most out of Freak and DomainStats.py. So Freak and DomainStats.py are two free open source tools that I've written and made available for you to download. Here's a little bit about me. Um, I am a pen tester, incident response guy. I have a consulting company. I'm a senior instructor for SANS. I developed a course, SEC 573, which is automating information security with Python. We'll talk about developing Python scripts to do defense, forensics, and offensive type uh, activities in information security. GSE number 15, as many of my other presenters that I've seen here um, are GSEs as well. Um, also, I got, I'm, I'm in the Metasploit source code at least seven times, even though I've never written anything for, uh, for the Metasploit framework, just based upon tools, techniques, protocols, things like or that uh, I've developed over the years. I'm here to talk to you about Freak.py and Freak Server, domain stats, and how, as security, anal uh, security onion analysts, you can get the most out of those two tools, which are part of the framework. They are in Security Onion, as well as a couple other SIM products uh, today. So um, with some tweaking, you can make some good use out of them, or just use them out as they are out of the box. So first, talk about domain stats. So the ideas for this came from uh, Justin Henderson, and he, he teaches uh, SANS SEC 555, which is SIM and Tactical ana an Analysis. The way Justin works is he calls you two days before Thanksgiving with a really good idea of something that you could write, and then just totally you know, derails your entire holiday as you sit there and you work through solving these interesting problems that'll pose to you. So this is probably two years ago, Justin called me up and said, hey, I got this idea, can you build this thing? And I was like, yeah, I think I can do that. So uh, he, he came up with, or he came up with the idea and Domain Stats was born. So here's what Domain Stats does for you. Um, and it looks at when domain names were registered. So I want to bring up an, a website like Google. Um, I have to go to an, uh, a registrar and buy that domain. When I do, there is a domain creation date. It's born, right? The record for that is first created. Well, as it turns out, domains like Google and Instagram and YouTube, they all have creation dates that are well, pretty old. Instagram or Snapchat's the baby of the group, and it's... 2012, so it's six years old. These legitimate domains, they take a while before people start using them and they have older creation dates than malware domains. So malware domains, an author buys a domain, stands it up and begins using it in their offensive operations. So I went out and I grabbed just uh, some malware domains from a list of known bad domains. I looked at their creation dates and here you can see 2017, 2000. Um, 2006, right? Not very old. Actually, I don't even think that one's malware, just based upon the fact that its date is in there. But I just grabbed the first top five, and I didn't want to just drop it off the list just because it was a bad example of where it didn't work. But this is such a good indicator that I suspect that if I went back and looked at this domain a little bit closer, I'd find that it, it might not be actual malware anymore. But anyway. So 2017, we'll, we'll ignore, pretend that one wasn't there. 2017, 2018, 2018. So the born on date is a pretty good indicator that this thing may be malicious. So if we can get born on dates integrated into Security Onion, integrated in our SIM platforms, and begin looking at those, this would be a good way for an analyst to identify some possibly malicious activity on our network. Well, the thing is, the who is systems are slow, right? You send off a query, it takes a couple of seconds for it to come back with a response. And if you're going through millions of logs, sending off um, requests to who is constantly just isn't practical. So I built a little web application uh, called Domain Stats. And you can install it. Um, you can go out to this GitHub re repo and just download it. It's just a single Python script. You run it and you pass it. Um, a port you want to listen to, and then you can pass it a bunch of different options that have to do with how it's going to cache information on your system. In this case, I'm telling it to listen on port 8000. Once I do, it stands up a web server, and then I can go into my log stash configurations and tell it any time I see a domain, I want to send off a request with that domain to this particular uh, website and get some more information on it. 
So for example, I can tell log stash to go to 127.0.0.1 port 8000 and ask for the domain information, creation date for a given domain, and it'll give me back the creation date for that particular domain. So you can just integrate this. Uh, Justin's got a bunch of configs out on his GitHub repo that you can download and use to get this stuff integrated into your sims. It's not just creation date, though. You can query every record that is in there. So if I drop on my URL, I drop the creation date. I just say domain sans.org. I get the entire sans record that's back from, uh, from the, the uh, server. This information is cached locally, so every subsequent request to sans.org is not going to go back out to the Whois server. It's going to just grab it from the local cache. And it makes it very fast and very feasible to um, run your logs through the system. Now, it's not just the creation date or the individual records. You can actually just list the fields you want separated by slashes in the URL, and you'll get back each of the individual fields. If you have a field like name servers that has multiple records, by, by default, it's just going to give you the first one. But if you were to add an asterisk next to the, or at the end of the field, it would give you back all of them. Where do you get a list of all the fields? Well, you just go back to that record where you said, show me the entire domain. And here's all your, do your names of the fields that you have for each of the records um, here. Okay, so domain stats. Uh, it's not just domain information, though. You can also look up in the Alexa top 1 million. Is this website in the Alexa top 1 million? In real time, in your sims, you're going through there. Is this uh, site in the Alexa top 1 million or not? So um, when you p start domain stats, if you pass the dash A option, and then give it an Alexa top 1 million file, then it's going to load that up in there and allow you to start doing queries. Now, as soon as you give it an Alexa domain name, it will automatically kick off a process in the background where it's going to start going through all those host names and looking them up in the background, pre-staging the cache with those host names. So one of the requests or questions I'll get is, all right, Firing up domain state, uh, domain stats, and all this traffic started going on my network, but nothing was being logged to it. What's going on? No, I am not backdooring your computer. What is happening is, is it's preloading all of these domain records into its cache. You can control that with the preload option. So preload zero says, don't look up any of my Alexa top one million in the background. Okay. Um, and then once you do that, you just give it the URL of Alexa, a domain, and it'll tell you what its ranking is in the top 1 million. Keep in mind, when we talk about the Alexa top 1 million, it's no longer the Alexa top 1 million, right? That, they have stopped releasing updates to that. It's actually now the Cisco umbrella um, top 1 million, and this URL, you can download that there. Oh, by the way, this is a link to my slides that I'm looking at right now, and this is my Twitter handle, and this is the course I wrote. All advertisements are in the bottom one-fourth of the screen, OK? All right. Um, I'm also beta testing a new feature. I got a request from someone to do some puny, uh, puny URL or IDN domain name resolution for them. So if you're getting in host names that look like this, right, these are Unicode representations of host names so that people can have uh, websites of smileyface.com or uh, iHeartPython. Um, dot com, right? So these puny, uh, puny code domain names um, are out there, and this isn't released into the, ma uh, the, the master branch yet, but it's a beta feature that I've got out there. If you're interested in using this, uh, give me, send me an email, let me know. I need some people to test it out, because I'm not quite sure how useful this is going to be. When you, when you take these Unicode characters and put them into Logstash and other products, I'm not sure how they are going to handle the Unicode characters. So, uh, so it's not in the main branch yet. But if you're interested in this feature, please let me know, and we can test it out together. Now, by default, Domain Stats has a database, a copy of the, the top 1,000 most commonly used domains in a database that's on the hard drive. So when you fire it up, it's not going to actually do any queries to the uh, internet unless you tell it give it the Alexa file. It's going to just use that local database of the top 1,000. Now, that's very useful if you're looking, just looking for creation date. Right? The creation date for Google is not going to change. But there are 
DNS servers might, and the registrar contact might, and some other information might. So if you're not using the creation date, then you might want to disable the use of the local cache. But if all you're interested in is the creation date and looking at how everybody's using it, that's usually all anybody's interested in is just the creation date. If all you're using is the creation date, then only having the top 1,000 domains in there is chump change. Right? So there is a tool called Update Disk Cache. And what Update Disk Cache does is you run it, and it'll update the records for the top 1,000 domains. So you'll have an, a local copy of the who is records for the top 1,000 records. But you can tell it, I would like the top 1 million records. So what you could do is you could say, go all in and just download the, all of the records for it. Now, you could, um, there could be lots of questions. I'll sometimes get questions about, well, couldn't you do this with the caching, and couldn't you do this with the caching? Yes. The answer is I could do all of those things with the caching. But what I've done is I've given you command line options to allow you to disable um, disk preloads, uh, control preloads, control the cache times. So whatever it is that you might want to do with caching, there's a command line option to let you control that stuff. And as I said, um, I suggest if you're just using creation date, go all in. Right? So run that update, uh, update disk cache. And you can see that when one of its options is dash C. So have it download the top 1 million most commonly used domains and store that in its database. And then you won't have to go out to who is server for anything. And it'll be very fast with uh, local caching. Another tool I, uh, I developed it's integrated into Security, Tune, uh, Security Onion is Freak Server. So I was sitting in 511, which is one of Sans classes uh, on um, What's the, what's the title? I, I do work for SANS. Continuous oper security monitoring continuous operation. Thank you, sir. Okay, and we're, they were talking about uh, the difficulty in identifying um, random host names, right? So the idea is it applies to DGAs, but as Brad was just showing us, the, um, the BitTorrent uh, uh, or uh, Tor traffic and other things, we'll see random host names that are generated on our network that are not standard host names, right? The idea of a host name is I want to come up with something that a human being is going to remember. These random garbage names aren't things that human beings are going to um, remember, but malware will typically use them. The reason why is, well, I build my botnet and I have all of these infected clients coming back to me and talking to me, and I have them all pointing to mybotnet.com. And then the FBI, law enforcement comes, and they take down mybotnet.com. I lost connection to all of my bots. I want to be able to control them. So we build algorithms into the bots so to have them choose a new host name and then connect back to there so that the attacker can regain control of the bots. Well, if their algorithm comes up with randomly the name google.com, they're out of luck, right? Because they ain't going to get that domain name. So the dom domain algorithms typically come up with very obscure looking host names like this, right? As their host name, everybody connects to it, and then the attacker gains control. We're talking about the difficulty of coming up with, uh, with identifying these things. There's lots of, of um, artificial uh, intelligence learning and machine learning that can go into these things. There's all kinds of algorithms that are out there. But I came up with a pretty simple way of doing it. Uh, one of the difficulties is, you know, that all of our host names are actually in the ASCII range. So if we have 255 possibilities per byte, and all of our characters are just in the ASCII range, well, lowercase letters plus period, what, that's 27 characters that we're really talking about, 27 out of 255. So the randomness, the entropy of a single byte of data is very, uh, very low, right? It's, it's, you're, you're only using a small subset of the bytes. So entropy doesn't really work in identifying these. Um, but I came up with an idea that I, I think works pretty well. And the idea is I'm going to me measure the frequency of character pairs. So I came up with freak.py and freak server. So here's what freak.py does. It'll look and it'll say, let's say that I want to measure, um, I want to build a database of what I'm going to consider to be known good words. So I'm going to measure bad bananas. I'll look and I'll say, OK, there's one B and there's one A. So I'll build a database that says, all right, B is followed by A one time. A is followed by D one time. 
D is followed by space, and then I had to make a decision, right? Do I, do I actually want to record spaces in my database? The first version of freak.py that I developed didn't count spaces in the database. It just ignored spaces. That was a design mistake, okay? So um, this last year I released uh, an update to freak.py where it actually does count D space in calculating its totals. And then when you tell it to measure the frequencies of things, you can turn off or on the inclusions of those domains are those additional characters when you are having it score things. So I'll add D, D is followed by space, space is followed by B, B is followed by A again, so now I have two Bs, and it was followed by A two times, so forth, so on. I'll measure this for all my domains, and I come up with a table that looks lo something like this. So now you ask me, all right, well, hey, using this table, uh, what's the probability that this is normal? We can see by looking at this that there's a 100% chance that if you have a B, it's going to be followed by an A. If you have the letter A, well, there is a 50% chance it's followed by an N, 25% chance it's followed by a D, and a 25% chance it's followed by an S. So I can measure the probability of character pairs coming together. So now I come up with some other domain, and I want to know whether or not it's normal. I can measure it across those character pairs. There's two ways that I can figure out whether or not a domain is normal or abnormal. One is uh, using the original method that freak.py came up with, which I'm calling the average probability. And the other one is what this new method that's integrated into it now, um, which I'm calling word probability. So let's look at each of these. So for the first method, the way that it's always been working up until now, um, is I want to measure queen. So I'll say Q followed by U. Well, there's a 95% chance that if you have a Q, the next letter is going to be a U. UE, there's a 32% chance of this. And notice, if you're pulling out calculators, all of these numbers are made up, right? They're just, they're, I did not bother to figure out what the actual probability is. It's just a for example, okay? All right. <clears throat> Uh, e followed by E, and so forth, so I can get the probabilities of each of these character pairs here. Then I can average them and say, okay, the average probability of queen is, it's a 42% 42, 42 chance that that's an actual word. And if you take something like this, all right, E followed by a B, yeah, there's, there's very few occurrences of that. Um, B followed by U, very few occurrences of that, and so forth. So this very much lower frequency probability that that's normal text and would be a domain that we would see coming across our network. So that's the old way. The new way would be, I'm going to just total up the number of first characters and second characters. All right, so I had 462 U's uh, followed by um, U 440 times. So the, the total for first characters is 462. Total for second characters is, uh, is 440 and so forth. And then I just add up all of my first characters, divide it by all of the second characters, and it gives me basically a word probability, a probability that queen is, is uh, a good word based upon the total numbers across that. This is the new one. And I think that this new way is a better way to identify malicious domains on the network. Okay? And one reason that I think it's, it's better, um, well, I'll show you that in a slide. So let's just see how effective these are. Um, so here I'm measuring the frequency. Frequency measure Google.com, measure YouTube.com, Reddit. So these are normal, legit domains. And how do they score? Well, you'll notice that for method one, which is the average probability, um, they all score above five. So we'll say anything above five is normal for the uh, method one. For method two, they all score above four, right? And they're almost five. This one's 4.99, but we'll just call it four for, for argument's sake. How about the malicious domains? So there's some same domains we looked at earlier. We run those through the servers, and you can see that my numbers are significantly lower. So two for method one, two for method two, so forth. I got a one for method one. So it's really good at figuring out that these are not normal characters based upon these frequency tables that I've built. The reason I think that method two is better is because method one is thrown off by single groups of 
very probable characters. So Q followed by a U, like I said, there's a 99.56 something percent chance that if you have a U in English language, the next character is going to be U, right? Wheel of Fortune, right? You have a T, what's the next letter? H, 45% chance, right? So there's a good chance that it can be thrown off by a high probability. So here I take this domain that is identified as malicious by my scores here, and I just add a Q, I'll just change that B to a U, and you can see method one, no longer malicious, but method two, it still is malicious. Here I have this domain, I'll just add a Q to the front of it, and method one is thrown way off by the presence of that QU. Now method two, you can still throw it off, right? You just, you're going to use highly probable characters that appear in legitimate, more frequently in um, English, like, you know, ER, right? Happens high uh, frequency, but the characters are weighted on, based upon how often they occur in normal English. So this is a much more reliable way of detecting the frequencies. All right, so how can I get all of this stuff integrated into my sim? Well, that's what Freak Server does, right? So with Freak Server, you download that and it'll provide you with a sim interface. This is how you can get this thing installed. It's already installed for you in Security Onion and configured. Um, but if you want to do it somewhere else, you just git clone um, Freak off of my website, everything, or off my GitHub. Everything that you need is in that directory. Change in the directory, and then you start it. Right? I recommend using Python 3 to run both of these tools instead of Python 2. You'll get some better performance out of it. Uh, but these tools will run either Python 2 or Python 3. So I'm going to run Python 3, run Freak Server, tell it to listen on port 8000, and then you give it the name of the frequency table that you want it to use to measure the probabilities of these domains. I give you a frequency table in the GitHub. It's called Freak Server or Freak Table 2 2018, and it's got frequencies that are based upon analysis of political speeches, the complete works of Charles Dickens, um, War and Peace, Little Women, right? So it's just English text, right? So not very specific to what you're doing in your environments, but it works for standard English text. So now I've got it as a website. I can integrate this into my sim, um, configure log stash to start querying these domains. Um, as we go through it, I tell uh, my web server to go to port 8000, measure google.com, and I get back both measurements. If you're like, I only want one measurement of the, or the other, you can change it to measure one, and you only get the old legacy frequency tool number. You can change it to measure two, and you only get the new uh, frequency server number. Okay, so here's some legitimate domains. Here's some malicious domains. You can see that it's pretty effective in identifying these. Okay. All right, but here's the thing. My frequency table is based upon Little Women, War and Peace, Complete Works of Charles Dickens. A better way to do this is to build frequency tables that are based upon based upon information that's in your domain. So take your host names, take information that's specific to your organization, and build your own frequency tables. To do this, you'll use freak.py, and here I'm going to create a new frequency table called mydomains.freak. This just sets up the structure, but it's an empty database. Now I have to train it and feed information into it. You can use the dash n for normal to feed in what um, single domains, and this says mydomains.txt, but it's actually just reading, um, I'm actually just training it on mydomains.txt as being legitimate, and it scores that. Then you can measure things like mark.com, okay, you can see that that is what the score is for mark.com, or things like that, um, and it gives you these numbers. So I can create my own frequency tables. So for example, let's say that I wanted to build a frequency table that's based upon all of the names of files that are on my file server. I could say uh, uh, GCI, I could use PowerShell um, GCI to recursively go through my file system and I'm going to select the name property from every file that's on my server. I'm going to pipe that through out file and tell it to write a file 
called allfiles.txt and write it as ASCII files. In fact, it doesn't take UTF-8 as input. It wants ASCII files when building your frequency tables. Then I'm going to tell freak.py to create a new table called Windows 10 files. And then tally up everything that's inside of allfiles.txt and um, build a new frequency table that's based upon the names of the files that are in that file. And this will create Windows 10 files.freak. Now I can use freak.py-m to measure cmd.exe. You can see we have a 7 and a 4. We want to measure some random file name.exe, and we'll have 3s and 2s. So I can have a frequency table that's dedicated to file names. I can have a frequency table that's dedicated to host names. I could have a frequency table that's dedicated to SSL signing certificates for things that um, I have traveling across my network. And then I can use different frequency tables to measure each of the different things. Now, the way that you had to do this previously was, would be run three copies of freak.py. Have one listening on port 8000 that was, listen, um, that was going to resolve your file names, one listening on port 10,000 that was going to resolve your host names, and so forth. You don't have to do that anymore. With the uh, current version, you can say freak server, give it the port you want it to listen on, and then you can pass multiple frequency tables to it. So I can tell it, I want you to look up things based upon freak table 2018 and Windows 10 files.freak. And it'll allow you to do queries against each of those domain name tables. Now, if you use the keyword measure here in your URL, it's going to use the default table, which is this first one here. If you want to use any of the other tables, you just change the word measure to be the name of your file, or the name of your table. So go into the Windows 10 files.freak table and resolve this file name, and it'll resolve that for you. If you want just the first score, it's Windows 10 file name freak1. If you want the second score, it's Windows 10 file names dot freak2. And you can begin looking up these files. So now you just need one server um, listening on one port, and you can resolve each of your different types of frequency tables that are out there. As I said, it's already integrated into Security Onion for you. The, the freak score, so if you're out there and you see virtual host frequency analysis, these numbers, well, now you know what those numbers mean and where the, the things are coming from. I think, this is, I think this is using the freak score one, right? It's a, the first, the, the measure one on this, is that right? Yep. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure either. I think it's probably one because, so we went to lunch and, um, and Doug said, he said, hey, I just integrated the new security onion, um, uh, or the new freak.py tool into the security onion. And um, I think I pushed the GitHub update like five minutes before going to lunch with Doug. And then, and then and I just totally couldn't tell Doug that, um, hey, awesome, because <laughs> I just pushed that out there. Um, so, but, but uh, it's pretty easy to update, right? It's just copying that, that script over there, and you've got it dockerized and stuff like that, but um, it's out there. So I see your hand in the back. I'll, I'll come up to you in just a second, um, uh, Tony. So let me know if, if what it's doing is working for you, right? If there's a feature that, uh, you know what, this tool would be so much better if it did, ugh, right? Let me know, right? And I will integrate it into the, the, the tool if I can. Um, things like the puny code, I love to receive feature requests and things like that so that I can add these tools out there and make them do what you want. If, um, if I can't do it, well then the other alternative is I would love to teach you how to do it. So, if you're interested in learning how to develop some Python tools, things like that, come check out um, SANS 573, um, which is Automating Information Security with Python. I'll teach you how to write tools that can consume things from Active Directory, consume things from binary files, and then build these tools that you can feed into your SIMs and other products um, so you can consume and your analysts can make better use of that. Tony, you have a question for me.
Um, I'm not sure I completely heard the question. I heard something about uh, CloudFront domains and like the random virtu virtual host stuff that's at the beginning. Could this help to identify those? So is the question, will this pick those up? Right, okay. So it's a, it's a good question. What, what happens with these domains that are, are, it's, that are showing up as random that I don't want to see? Perhaps they're static domains. Um, so for example, let me see how, how hard this would be to show you this. Um, freak, freak, all right. So let me make my font a little bit bigger here. All right, can you old people in the back see this? Okay, thank you. All right, so Python um, freak, let's use Python, uh, uh, Python freak.py, let's measure junk.com, right, measure, and uh, I gotta give it a uh, frequency table. So let's give it freak um, table, 2018, and so much slower than the um, actual website. Okay, yeah, it's once the domain site and the caching get in there, it's it's a big difference, right? All right, so that is a very improbable um, uh, character set. Oops, now I did want that part in there. The part I didn't want was this. Let's measure google.com. Okay, so that scores above my thresholds on this one. But what about this website? If you work for this um, organization, this would drive you crazy. CIA.gov. Okay. Okay, so according to freak.py, CIA.gov is evil. Okay, I'm, I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong, but it does believe it's um, evil. Now I wanted, to, I wanted to not believe that the CIA is evil. Okay, so I'm going to say, hey, CIA.gov is normal and the weight of that is 10,000 times, right? So now it's going to go into the databases and it's going to update all of the counts for CIA.gov um, 1,000 times or 10,000 times, updating all those tables, recalculating everything, and then I say, okay, tell me, is CIA.gov evil? And it comes back and tells me that, in fact, CIA.gov is still evil. <laughs> okay. But you can see that the, it's, it's less evil than it was, right? So, so it's getting better. Uh, and I could, I could add in another 10,000 counts on CIA.gov, and then they would be completely, um, completely good. Okay, but you can just go and adjust your frequency tables, tune out the noise. If you know you've got hosts that have random names and things like that that are throwing off your scores, that is permanently stored into that frequency table. Of course, you might want to create your own customized frequency tables that are based upon your domains, and then these things go away. Other questions? Yes, sir. The, the one where I just updated CIA? Uh, oh, oh freak, ta freak Table is out there. Freak Table is on my master uh, GitHub. It should be, should see one called Freak Table 2018. No? 
So are you, uh, yeah, so are you on uh, github.com slash markbaggett slash freak? And it's not there? Yes, I will push that to my um, master table. Okay. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so how well does it work on other top-level domains? Um, yeah, dot .ninja? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we could, we could give it any set of domains, but it, if it's normal characters, and I, I think it should work pretty well on uh, CIA.ninja. <laughs> if, if nobody owns that domain, I'm registering it. But, um, so it, as long as the words are pretty close to normal English words, right, unless there's a top-level domain that's like X5, you know, thing, then say Ninja is less evil than .gov. So, Some of the country codes, yeah, but it's, it's probably just going to be, if it's a two-letter country code, it's probably not going to throw off the, uh, the characters that, that much. Really, if, you, if we looked at the malicious host domains or like the ones that you saw with Tor in, in Brad's presentation, it's, it, these are long sets of strings. Because remember that the attacker has to get a domain name that's unique enough that somebody's not going to already own it. And everybody, right, all of the four-letter combinations... Um, are taken by somebody. Five letters, right? Everybody's uh, coming up with the acronyms for their company, so they're generally speaking pretty long uh, host names. Yes? Could I train it on red, regex? Well, everybody knows that all regular expressions are evil. Um, but I suppose, I, I haven't tried it. That, that, uh, that would certainly be interesting. An, an interesting artifact of this, so I, I, the answer to your question is, uh, um, but I'd like to try that. An interesting thing that you can do with this is, uh, if, you ever, if you ever tried to identify base64 inside of, of your files, like you've got a bunch of things uh, and um, you're going through your logs and you want to identify all the base64 strings and then pass it off to a decoder so you can look and see what's inside of there. Right, differentiating base64 from normal ASCII without trying to first decode it and see if it successfully decodes can be difficult because base64 is, well, it's ASCII, right? With perhaps an equal sign at the end. This is actually really good at identifying base64 strings. So base64 strings are going to be flagged as non-standard or not normal domains um, as you go through there. So it can help in decoding those things as well. Okay. Other questions? I'm getting no questions. So thank you for having me out. Appreciate it, Doug. Thanks, Bill.